I would like to welcome you all to this Team Society webinar. My name is Sarah Heidenreich. I'm a researcher at the Department uh, for Interdisciplinary Studies of Culture. And I'm coordinating the Team Society together with Thomas Moschulzwoll. Um, team Society is one of several teams under, under NTNU Energy. And we are focusing on social science and humanities research on different issues related to energy and sustainability. And today's webinar will be about living well within the donut. And we have the following speakers, Elizabeth Barron from the Department of Geography here at NTNU and Marius Kuschnes at the Department of Interdisciplinary Studies of Culture here at NTNU. And after the presentation, we will get comments from a discussant who is Kristin Lindenrud from the Norwegian University of Life Sciences. And after the comments, then we will open for general discussion and questions from the audience. So I would now like to give the digital floor to Elizabeth and Marius for their presentation. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. And thanks to Team Society for inviting us to give this talk today. Um, we are gonna be presenting uh, the sort of more conceptual elements of a research proposal that um, Marius and Heidi Nielsen uh, from Department of Industrial Economics and I collaborated on in the summer primarily in response to a call from NTNU Sustainability uh, for support for PhDs and postdocs in the social sciences and sustainability. So <clears throat> this is a fairly new collaboration, um, but we found that it was very positive experience and very um, generative. And so we are hoping to bring this forward, but what we're gonna to talk to you about today are the sort of foundational elements of our thinking. Let's see, there's a little delay here. There we go. So the project, as is evidence from the title, obviously is based on um, expanding on Kate Raworth's donut economics idea which you see um, a figure here on the left side of the slide, uh, which is taking that idea and applying it in a bit of uh, research. But the premise is very clear. So for those of you that are not as familiar with the, the donut economics model, essentially what Raworth is positing is that there's this, as you see, safe and just space for humanity, which is in between the ecological ceiling set by the planetary boundaries framework pictured on the right side of the slide uh, and originally sort of posited by Rockstrom et al. and also taken up very widely across, um, I would say all, you know, a lot of natural and social science scholarship on um, sustainability and um, ecological limits. And so you see the seven, excuse me, nine categories delimited by the planetary boundaries framework on the outside, creating the outside of the donut or the ceiling. And then the inside or social foundation of the donut is <clears throat> um, actually drawing heavily from a number of different places, but you may recognize it, that it overlaps very well with the sustainability development goals or SDGs. And so the social foundation then is a sort of minimum requirements for humanity in these more social um, oriented domains. And what we found particularly interesting was what does the safe and just space for humanity really mean? What does it look like? And how is that fitting into um, the sort of donut economics thinking, which is being rapidly taken up and developed and um, very, um, I would say looked on quite promisingly in terms of finding some solutions on how to navigate these social ecological coupled systems. So I wanted to just go a little bit more into the donut economics thinking because there is a lot of really rich material within the donut and it's worth spending a little bit of time on unpacking that. So 
in Raworth's um, initial text, she does a really nice job of unpacking the history and the stories about how 20th century economics has developed the way that it has. And so it really gives some sort of almost, almost history of economic thinking of neoliberal capitalism and neoclassical economics focused on, as you see on the left side here, GDP, self-contained market, the rational economic man, and then a bunch of different elements of think, how to think about growth. And in the donut economics model, or what she calls 21st century economics, there is a list then of what are alternatives or almost um, natural conclusions to applying more modern more progressive thinking to 20th century economics. So you see that the way that she tells this story almost suggests that um, as we think about systems thinking and complexity thinking and incorporating all of the dynamics of um, human environment scholarship, we would naturally arrive at 21st century economics. And this has really been quite popular and been taken up quite um, quickly. And so, for example, on the right side, we have Amsterdam, um, the first city, if I'm not mistaken, to sort of declare themselves as <clears throat> a donor economic city and to now create their future sort of urban development, urban planning, environmental policy, all around this sort of donut safe uh, and just space for humanity. I just wanted to add that there are other sort of widespread and well-known um, mechanisms like this happening in other places. So donut economics is, is sort of exploding in Europe and Australia, but in the United States, there is a similar but different, and I would say slightly more radical model based on um, a system that was put in place in Cleveland, Ohio, called, now called the Cleveland model. Um, where you see that worker cooperatives and anchor institutions are forming the basis of this sort of shift in economic relationality, which also includes some environmental dimensions. So that has been widespread now, and I would say is active in at least 20 American cities. Our aims and objectives then in Well Within are to set out to examine the construction and application of the social foundations part of the donut, since we are social scientists, and think about this in relation to how we talk about and understand well being. So, asking what are the contents and the thickness of the safe and just space? We wanna do this because we are really interested in <clears throat> the potential to remake the way that we think about growth by reconnecting it to activities centered in place. And in this project specifically, we focused on practices of the home and food provisioning. One of the reasons that donut economics has really taken off in our opinions is that it manages to be critical of growth as understood within neoclassical economics and neoliberal sustainability policies. But it does this in a way that sort of maintains a relatively normative mainstream tone as if the logical outcome of applying sustainability thinking to economic conditions just naturally results in the donut. In other words, Raworth has built on ideas from critical theory and literature seemingly without the harshness of the critique that those of us in the critical social sciences are trained to and often use in our work. And I would argue sometimes is exactly what keeps that work to the side It's the sort of critical uh, voice or sound of it. <laughs> um, so our project engages with this body of critique just below the surface of the donut economics model and tries to move the conversation forward using the organizing principles of community economics theory and sufficiency thinking. So we've been thinking about how the inside of the donut variables correlated really heavily with the SDGs, for example, and drawing on some of the literature that is critical of the SDGs and thinking about why that is the case. Uh, Blake Ratner, for example, writing in uh, 2004 about the MDGs pointed out that they both emphasize the transformation of social uh, societal structures and institutions with technocratic solutions. Thus embedded in the unified framework of sustainability, 
is this connection to development agendas and issue-based policies, but it's less about, uh, it's less able to account for the particularities of individual places and the people and organisms that inhabit them. And also the ways that their interactions constitute those places. Bureaucratic and technocratic solutions tend to focus on how to overcome technical challenges and moral problems, but not on the underlying imbalances of power and varied and influential worldviews and historical patterns that have led to uneven development. So this in part for us is a response to the critiques that this kind of systems thinking overgeneralizes and emphasizes technocratic solutions. And so we really want to understand and try to delve into and unpack as it says, um, and re-embed the social and economic foundations which vary significantly across both time and space. To ground the project empirically, we focused in this proposal on food provisioning and shelter, specifically here in Norway. Related to food provisioning, we were interested in looking at the Rekoringen and similar organizations. And um, for those that may not be aware, Rekoringen is um, a farmer-driven organization based on Facebook where um, people can order food directly from the farmers and then pick them up at a sort of farmer's market at a set time once a month. And then we also were interested in looking more at shelter relation, specifically eco villages and Buritslag uh, to explore these connections in both cases between identity, food, relationships between needs and wants and sort of <clears throat> looking at a network in a way. As I mentioned, theoretically, we unpack the donut by integrating concepts operating at different levels of intervention in the mainstream economy. I'm gonna talk first about community economies theory a little bit, and then Marius is gonna talk about uh, concepts of sufficiency and socially responsible investing. So community economies theory seeks to bring about more sustainable and equitable forms of development by acting on new ways of thinking about economies and politics to try to mobilize social transformation. This is a, a direct quote from the website and the um, development of community economies theory has really been a long time coming, um, and I'll get to that in just a minute. But now we can say very clearly that it's premised on anti-essentialist thinking, affirms that our lives unfold in what's called a pluriverse, and posits that we are all engaged in ongoing processes of learning with each other and the world around us, always, quote, becoming ethical subjects. One of the key visual dimensions or sort of teaching elements of the community economies thinking is what we call the iceberg, uh, which helps us to situate existing economic politics within a diverse economy and to expand our language of economics to move beyond the essentializing vision of capitalism. This is a really useful visual tool because like icebergs, it shows that the sort of essentialist elements of economic engagement are really a small part of our economic lives. So you see that what would traditionally be considered to be a capitalist marketplace of wage labor, commodity markets, and capitalist enterprise is that 10% of the iceberg that you see above the waterline. But that in fact, there is a huge array of economic practices that in ways that we exchange value and create value, things like um, credit unions, housing cooperatives, gleaning, harvesting, wild food, hunting, um, family care, that are all sort of highly valuable and in fact economic in ways of engaging with each other that are below the waterline. This is an especially useful tool with students because when I have worked with students both in the US and Norway, they most clearly and immediately understand their role in the economy as economic subjects, as consumers. And sometimes if you work with them a little bit and then they quickly realize that they are also workers, but that's kind of the end of their economic subjectivity or economic identity. And understanding economic engagement beyond this 
reproduction of capitalist processes can really have a profound effect on how we understand, as I said, value and our own labor and how we relate to the environment around us. In fact, just uh, last week, I was listening to a podcast where um, Esther Perel, who's a very well-known psychotherapist, was talking about how many contemporary relationships that we have have lost a sense of commitment in exchange for a sense that there might always be something better out there. And that this represents what she called a consumerist approach to relationships. And the idea that we are always shopping for love, something that is supposed to have no economic value at all, really demonstrates how deeply these essentialist logics have perpetrated into our psyches. And this is the very element of 20th century capitalism that Raworth is critiquing. Both the donut and the iceberg give us these visual metaphors to think more expansively about economic engagement. So finally, for my part, I just want to mention that the work of, um, of our, our work and Raworth's work rests on a lot of really other innovative and theoretical, perhaps more critical work um, dating back to the 70s. And so, for example, E.F. Schumacher wrote in the 1970s, I think it was published in 73, um, a very famous text called Small is Beautiful, as you see on the right side, where he introduced, among other ideas, the idea of Buddhist economics, which is um, somewhat similar to the ideas of sufficiency that Marius will talk about shortly. Inspired by feminist, political, economic, and post-structural theory, Gibson Graham wrote in 1996, a very influential text, which really started the community economies um, theory and some uh, sort of as a foundational text in alternative economic geography, where they explain the, rather than waiting for the end of capitalism, we can remake our own understandings of the world to see that capitalism is only one part, and in fact, a relatively small part of economic practice. More recently, Arturo Escobar in Designs for the Pluriverse argues that rather than serving consumerist and capitalist aims, what he calls, quote, autonomous design can attend to questions of environment, experience, <coughs> excuse me, and politics while focusing on the production of human experience based on the radical interdependence of all beings. In all three of these examples, we see issues of justice, balance with the environment, and the importance of the narratives of people and place highlighted in ways that probe deeply into experience, process, and what it means to be human constantly negotiating an ongoing world of change and changes in not only our places, but also our political and economic systems. Okay, and so now we're gonna to turn to Marius who will tell us a little bit about sufficiency thinking. Yeah, thank you. So sufficiency is a um, concept that fits well within uh, these set of ideas and also within the this type of degrowth uh, perspective. Uh, and it's not a completely new concept. It's been around since the 90s um, and it has been uh, theorized in a variety of ways. Um, but the way that it's used in this uh, project is uh, as an organizing principle to try to get at this safe and just space that was uh, already introduced. That's also um, kind of, uh, uh, that, that's uh, very central to the donut economics idea. But um, it's also um, suggesting a way of analysis and has sort of a, a way to understand that um, how we have ended up in uh, the way that we organize uh, our lives right now is also connected to a history of um, uh, socializing and uh, uh, developing into um, a certain way of organizing uh, our everyday. So this is why um, the sufficiency concept is useful to um, open up some of these uh, understandings of how we are um, embedded in today's uh, practices. So um, the way that I'm uh, using it in this pro project particularly is um, inspired by a constructivist and a practice-centered understanding. And um, it's also basically including the possibility of having enough of something for a certain purpose. And uh, the point is that uh, 
there are many reasons why we uh, do the things we do today, but we need to really look at uh, both the historical and also the socio-technical and material and cultural surroundings to understand how that looks. And that's something that we don't really understand so well today. So if you take the next slide. Um, uh, yeah, uh, the one back. So uh, sufficiency has been argued uh, as sort of a critique of the efficiency focus that's uh, been at the center stage the past, uh, let's say, 50 years. Um, and the way that it's used here is basically to look at uh, supply and demand and understanding that demand is not only met, it's also something that is made and also consciously made. And through the way that we organize society and the way that the economy is organized. And it's also critiquing our understanding of basic needs, because um, at the end of the day, um, there is no unified or universally accepted way of understanding what basic needs actually are. So uh, these are changing over time and depending on context. And they could also look otherwise. It is possible to have a situation where we humans have good lives, uh, but where some of the conditions that we are today taking as essential might not be there. Um, so this uh, understanding of um, how our needs and habits have become normalized at uh, unsustainable levels is basically what is studied uh, through this sufficiency perspective, asking the question, what is what is enough and when when is something enough for us as humans? Um, the next slide. So uh, this is the perspective that um, Heidi brought into uh, our project uh, from a more economic point of view, because we do think that there is still a role of uh, economic and business and also finance in uh, safe and just space. It's not something that we can simply um, think our way out of. So um, trying to address that also, understanding how uh, business models would look that are actually aligned with the safe and just space understanding is also part of uh, this project. So um, the question then is, how do we make systems that in invite both public and private money into these types of initiatives, and also uh, increasing the social and financial wealth, and maybe also shifting the waterline in the iceberg that uh, was introduced by Elizabeth to embed more of those things that are currently not actually counted as part of the, the formal economy. Um, some of these concepts that uh, Heidi uh, elaborate on are called socially responsible investments and impact investments. And these um, I probably will not talk so much more about because I don't know enough about them. Um, uh, but if you have questions about that, we can also uh, get you in touch with Heidi. So in an economist language, um, how can we channel bigger parts of the finance into a, a strong sustainability understanding as opposed to the traditional green growth or weak sustainability understanding that we have um, that is currently uh, dominating. So to move to the conclusions, uh, what we're arguing is basically that we, we need to start engaging with and researching new ways of organizing society that are specifically addressing a safe and just space for humanity using all the different types of tools that we have available. If you can, yeah, thank you. So um, the iceberg uh, that was presented by Elizabeth reminds us that people already engage in a wide array of economic activity in which value is created and that social and material value are not owned by uh, capitalist logics and systems. And the sufficiency perspective, if you click uh, one more, no, yeah, um, begs the question, what is actually enough for uh, us humans and how can we organize society uh, in that direction? Also understanding that this is not only an individual or a psychological perspective that we need to limit ourselves, but that this actually is embedded into our practices, uh, habits and everyday life. So if we go to the final slide. Um, all of this means that we need to start poking into the nitty gritty of how we want to organize society. And these questions are still open-ended. It's not something that we know or understand very well how it will 
look and and given that there are these global problems connected to climate change and also biodiversity loss and uh, loss of nature we we really have to start understanding this now we don't want to be pushed into a situation where we are unprepared for what's coming and of course uh, the idea of local solutions seems to be central to this but it's also not easy to understand how they articulate with global pressures in the Anthropocene, both economic and environmental, apart from these growth-centered models that have dominated so far. So I think that's all we had, and we open for comments. Yes, thank you very much, Elizabeth and Marius, for this really, really interesting presentation. I would like to give the word to Christine first for her comments, and then we open for a general discussion afterwards. So Christine, mm -hmm. if you would like to share your slides. Now, I think oh. I see the last slide now. Oh, that's the last slide. I thought I took a prompt of it. Uh, slideshow. And OK. That's yes, it. Now we see it. Yeah. Great. Yes. OK. <clears throat> so you had an idea. I've read the slides and listened carefully. And I will give some discussion points. Some you might find useful. Others are a bit on the side, perhaps. But <clears throat> I will start very briefly. Now I have my co-author here disturbing me, Aling Holden. Because I would just say that Aling Holden and myself, we have been writing about something very similar to uh, Donut Economics since 2007 when we first published a paper on sustainable development area that was just about uh, <laughs> just uh, thank you marius it was just about finding indicators for development justice and environment and setting thresholds so as to define a space where we can you can call it a just and safe space we call it a sustainable development space and then we have been writing books about uh, this model, about the theories behind, about the ethics, that we believe sustainable development is an ethical statement. And uh, very much like Kate Rover, the I can't pronounce that name, Kate, I call her Kate, um, just like Kate, we built a normative model and perhaps not that good at showing exactly how to get there be more interested in focusing on where to go and what i would like to say about the donut the visual expression the donut is that it belongs to a group of normative sustainable development models so i think that you should reflect that in your project but she is one very influential voice in uh, in this area but there are many other voices doing exactly the same finding indicators explaining why these indicators are important and then setting thresholds to be met other models that look at sustainable development goals that is environment justice and needs they use either dashboards with a lot of goals and indicators or they try to measure sustainable development using just one number, composite indicators. When it comes to donut economics, I'm a bit unsure if that term will uh, survive in the long run. I think donut economics relates to a lot of influential uh, economic uh, concepts uh, and is one, she's very elegantly put them together. But uh, for instance, they uh, are very much related to economics on respecting environmental limits. And she uses a lot 
of uh, the theories from ecological economics and environmental economics. For instance, here comes a very long point, but she starts by criticizing neoclassical economics. And to say it's more uh, simple, um, neoclassical economics is about using all available ingredients to make the largest cake. And it's not so much about slicing that cakes into equal slices so that it's distributed in an equal way. Uh, so that's one critique. And the other critique is that neoclassical economics is all about these rational agents maximizing utility. And it's also about that you can substitute one factor for another. So if you um, destroy nature, then you can substitute nature with technology, for instance. And um, that's uh, aspects of neoclassical economics that is criticized by many, including economists. So of course, not all environmental problems can be solved by setting a price on CO2 emissions, for instance, and ecological economics, and uh, lately also environmental economics, starts by focusing on the biosphere as providing ecosystem services. And that creates the idea that there are limits to human activity. And there are economists like Paul Eakins at London School of Economics, Dieter Helm at the Environmental Center of, uh, or the same center that uh, Kate is uh, working at in Oxford. Uh, and of course, these planetary boundary uh, scientists, Rockström and Stefan, that focuses on these limits. And out of this grows a lot of economic approaches, circular economy, natural capital approach, ecological footprints, etc. that Kate refers to. Uh, the problem is perhaps that these contributions are more normative than descriptive. Uh, it's not obvious that people will actually act in a way that respects these uh, limits. Then secondly, donut economics is also about needs and justice. And here I would like to refer to a lot of very influential uh, theorists uh, like Amartya Sen and Anthony Atkinson, Ian Goff uh, at London School of Economics, Thomas Piketty and John Rawls, etc. And these should be built into, uh, if, you, if you consider these aspects, and I guess you know about all these, you should rather refer to them than only to Kate. And so I think donut economics appears new, but rather built on the shoulder of guidance. And uh, it's very influential, but you should also perhaps more frame the project in, within ecological economics and uh, economics focusing on equality and human needs. So the challenges with donut economics is that the idea of a rational economic agent, I don't think it can be dismissed altogether. I think we do try to improve our lot. Uh, and even the Nobel Prize winner, uh, Daniel Kahneman, find evidence that we are in a way rational although within boundaries and although we are concerned with equity, not only maximizing profit, we are rational. And the question one should ask is, so why should we willingly give up short-term welfare to help future generation, the nature and poor people? And uh, here, uh, the theory of degrowth is perhaps not so much a theory as a narrative of where we should go. And even Kate is a bit skeptical. She says in a seminar we attended in uh, Oxford that degrowth literature points to the problems, but it's less clear on how to what should we replace capitalism with? How should we organize society in a different way? And uh, she is better, but she, like us, is better at explaining where we should end up than whether it's likely that we will end up in this place. So six suggestions. Um, I don't think the first point is so relevant for you perhaps, but there is a literature on how to improve synergies, how to reduce trade-offs. 
that's uh, one way of approaching the challenges. Uh, also, there are people um, working with good example, living labs, innovation literature that you represent perhaps. And if you extend that to not only be about climate mitigation, but also about social justice and human needs, that's a way forward. Um, third, um, this is one person I've I've not read uh, her contribution, but I think Elinor Ostrom, that is, I guess, more that something that you are familiar with, may be also a, a source of inspiration because she's more about development of social norms and how we uh, form collect collective actions. And also you have Amartya Sen, you have Ian Goff at London School of Economics. You have many people that are focusing on these norms and collective actions. Fourth, uh, I've been reading this book uh, by, by uh, the Israel historian Yuval Noah Harari, Sapiens, and I'm very fascinated by his idea that ide ideologies can be the glue that makes us draw together in a direction. Uh, it can be the idea of human rights, it can be democracy, it can be sustainability. But you have an idea of where it's more like an ethical turn on sustainable development literature, that you look at what kind of ideologies can make us do something that a rational economic agent would not do, because you believe this is the right way forward. And here you can look at moral philosophy, psychology, etc. And perhaps narrative as a research method can be a way forward here. And fifth, uh, you have economists uh, focusing on maximum income levels, consumption corridors, sufficiency, etc. So I point to some economists here. And finally, economists focusing on natural and social capital, including the British economist Dieter Helm and Paul Eakins, among others. But I'm a bit unsure if you can both look, use the economists' language of natural and social capital and investments on one hand, and on the other, present the idea of small is beautiful and uh, sufficiency and income corridors on the other. I think both two narratives, they are so different. So I think it's hard to combine them in one project. I think you have to choose. Either talk about nature and, and social capital and talk the economist, use the economist language or focus on the narratives of small is beautiful or um, sufficiency and that uh, perhaps using narratives as a research uh, instrument. Um, the last slide, you focus on two cases, food provisioning and shelter. And I am just a bit skeptical. Are people shopping at Rekoringen like myself and living in eco villages? Do they live a more sustainable life than others? Uh, for instance, according to the biologist Wilson that wrote the book Half Earth, we should live in compact cities to be able to preserve nature. And also, it's not totally clear how respecting environmental limits are captured in these two examples. I understand that you think about reducing waste, reducing consumption, sharing economy, etc. But how do you protect biodiversity and how do you actually reduce emissions? And what about equity and needs? Rekoringen and eco villages are not necessarily appealing to poor people. Eco and eco villages may also be in conflict with farming land. If you read about Bjorn Dardi, that suggests the eco village at Mjösa, and it's in conflict with farming land. And we had the same in the small village Leikanger, where I used to live, where Carlo All, that you may know, suggested an eco area with small houses. And he was in conflict with all the farmers because this was farming land. And uh, when I buy my chicken uh, at Rekoringen, it costs three or four times as much 
as I, if I buy it at the Rema. And is that uh, good for poor people, single mother with three kids? And also I think about the future. Is ecological farming the way forward to feed the planet if the population increases with 50%? What about biotechnology? So there are some questions that I think should be raised or where you should be uh, critical as researchers when um, looking at these examples. So that's it. Thank you very much, Christine, for these rich comments, both about the wider framing of the project and the particularities about the cases. Uh, Marius and Elizabeth, would you like to reply, comment? Well, it's a lot of very good points in there. I uh, don't know where to start. Alyssa, do you, do you have something you want to start on? or? I was just going to say you should go first since I gave the presentation <laughs> okay, first. Yeah. So. Of course, yeah. I mean, I think a lot of the points that you mentioned are, are things that we have, um, we have, of course, thought about many of these things uh, as well. And I, th I would say that on the one hand, um, it's a, it's a, our approach is representing a reaction to the mainstream approaches to that use economic languages, uh, economics language, and that is using uh, these understandings of rational, uh, rational consumption or rational uh, beings as a point of departure for um, um, yeah how we interact in society, and um, I think that what you mentioned about narratives is probably more close to the approaches that we are using here, because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, also uh, economic growth and uh, homo economicus are also just narratives that have been circulated for a long time already. And uh, our understandings of uh, profit, for example, profit that's extremely necessary for creating economic benefits. It's also just a narrative in, in many ways that could be regulated for example, by a strong state. But um, so I think that what we're suggesting is in many ways, um, how will how will society uh, be organized if we're thinking that economic growth is no longer possible in the long run, uh, given the planetary boundaries? And then I think that we cannot uh, look, we cannot draw so much from the economics literature as uh, has been done the past, uh, let's say, past 50 years. Because um, even though no one really has the solutions for this, I think that we need to look elsewhere uh, to find the solutions. And so, for example, the sufficiency concept, where we are trying to understand how supply and demand is connected and how it's also connected to it with the way we organize society and the practices, our habits, routines, how those things are connected. And for example, just the understanding that what we like, I mean, what we uh, think about as comfort today, that's something that we have become used to thinking about as comfort today over time through dynamics connected to, um, let's say, capitalism. So um, <clears throat> that means that uh, this can also change in the future. And that, of course, is uh, a normative understanding, but it's also um, probably some would maybe not call it a realistic understanding, but I would counter that that maybe is also because of the way that we are indoctrinated into an economics way of thinking. So I think it's it's relatively difficult to come up with solutions that um, break free from that type of paradigm. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, the, the point about local uh, local organization I think is uh, tricky because it's not necessarily the, the case that local ways of organizing will be the answer. Uh, but some form of organizing where um, food um, is sourced, uh, produced locally, for example, instead of having a global, uh, global system where we are relying on trade and expropriation of land and um, thinking about how can, how can you live a, a life without uh, taking opportunity of life away from someone else, you know, in a global perspective, you'd have to start thinking about what you're doing 
to your local community and how your actions are actually impacting other communities other places in the world right so so starting there and then trying to address those questions i think is is some of the work we're suggesting yeah i um want to say thanks marius for your comments because i think you said a lot of really um great points that i was also thinking i guess i would just um say to you Kristen, that i I really appreciated hearing your particular critique on donor economics because I can see in some ways we're sort of a kindred academic sort of spirits here that are sort of seeing, you know, this economic strategy that has become so widespread and popular and very aware of a diversity of academic work that is somehow staying on the sidelines in, um, but is part of that thinking as well. So I feel like your comments were, um, almost like a literature review for us to, you know, to make a reading list. Um, and I look forward to digging into your work uh, more. I, for my part, um, just want to push a little bit on this idea that we have to choose which academic um, field or area that we will situate ourselves. Because for me, part of my interest in being an academic is particularly to try to expand beyond these limited fields that we are constantly sort of subject subjected to and to create sort of novel and interesting scholarship I think um, for me it's very much about reading across fields and across disciplines and seeing what is possible to be made that is quite novel and different than what has come before so I think while it's important to obviously do your homework and read you know others work absolutely i i don't want to um be in one stream all the time so i uh, i think the the exciting thing is how can we be, be academics and produce engaging academic work that does new and different things that participating in those existing dialogues um maybe has not done up to this point that is quite necessary given the, cha the challenges that we're facing. 